Okay, so in previous class, actually, you already have some idea about the uh, electron migration, right? So first of all, when you deal with one material, uh, even though you apply an electrical field on it, the first thing come up from your mind should would be whether there's an electron migration happen in these materials. If the answer is yes, then you need to modify the driving force by the effective charge and also reformulate the atomic flux. But some people probably will, um, will ask a uh, professor how to determine uh, the current density is high enough or not, whether the EM effect happens on, in my system or not. Uh, to me, the, the easiest way would be uh, you can apply the electrical field for a while then after a while, then you can check whether there's a void formation and extrusion on your materials. Then that will be the most easy way to, uh, to estimate whether uh, there's EM happen in your material system or not. Okay? Okay, so let's move to the third section, thermal migration. Based on the, the, the term here, we know this atomic migration is due to the thermal driving force. Thermal driving force means the temperature gradient acting on these materials probably have chance to drive this atomic migration. So based on this, you definitely have some idea. This temperature gradient definitely need to very high, right? Okay, so, uh, so let me uh, introduce you. Uh, in these sections, we are going to First of all, we are going to give you a physical concept of thermal migration and how we can quanti quantify this effect. And similar to the, be the beta effective charge we introduced to you in the electron migration, here we also have a spatial term we call it the heat of transport to describe the direction uh, of the uh, atomic migration due to this temperature gradient. So the value and the sign of heat, uh, heat of transport, the term we call the heat of transport, the sign and value of heat of transport will give you uh, the direction of the TM induced atomic flux. And before we end it here, uh, this uh, sections we are going to give an example is a vacancy mediated. Uh, thermal migration. So let's give you uh, some uh, definitions about the thermal migration. So what's a thermal migration? It only happens when it happens on the we uh, that's a mass transport under the temperature gradient means the temperature gradient induces this mass transport. So in the beginning, how we uh, how scientists observe this phenomenon. So in the beginning, actually, in order to demonstrate whether uh, there's an exist of thermal migration, so they, um, they prepare this kind of settings. What we have here is we have the silicon substrate on the top. And on the, uh, there are very uh, many different types of microelectronic device uh, on the silicon substrate side and and the bottom part actually is we call the copper substrate we use the solder bond to connect or you call white out all the signal and electrical to the uh, from the second side to the copper substrate side and the main purpose uh, of the copper substrate is for heat dissipation so uh, and as you know, the the uh, the solder bond the responsibility for the solder bond is uh, allow the current in input and output uh, from the microchips, right? And as you as you know, the light width of the microelectronic device uh, on the second substrate side is smaller than that on the copper substrate side. So based on the jaw heating, the, or based on this, you know the current density on the second substrate side is larger 
much larger than that on the copper side. You got the higher current density means the jaw heating is high, is large, right? So you got the temperature higher on the silicon substrate side and the lower temperature uh, on the copper substrate side due to the difference in current density. And in this case, we ended two extra solder bond here, but without uh, there's no any current passing through. The only way this uh, so these two solder bonds suffer is the temperature gradient because they share the same silicon substrate and also the copper substrate. And we also assume the thermal conductivity of both these materials is good. So we want to uh, measure whether the thermal migration do exist on the solder bond. So let's only so if you take a look here, there's no current density, so only the temperature gradient be applied on this solder bond. The same temperature gradient as that apply on this uh, solder bond, but without the current density. So we try to under this case we try to enlarge this uh, part to be here. You can observe there's a solder bond. And due to the jaw heating, higher current density on the silicon side, we got a higher temperature. Lower current density, we got a lower temperature here. So this solder bond actually suffered the temperature gradient. The size of the solder bond is roughly 100 to 200 micrometer. And the temperature gradient probably 1 or 2 degrees C. So you can have some idea about this uh, temperature gradient. Okay, so uh, before we move forward, I want to explain some interesting stuff. You can observe this solder bump has different uh, design of the composition, right? The upper portion ac actually is a lead-rich lithium alloy, and the bottom darker gray part actually is, uh, is, uh, is the composition at, is at the lutetic point, right? If you check the binary phase diagram of the lead team, you can observe this actually is, a is at the lutetic point. So the design for this solder bond is, uh, as you know, the melting point at the lutetic point is, a, is lowest, right? So the upper portion, oh, sorry, the, the bottom portion uh, has a lower melting point, which will help you to uh, fabricate or bond to the copper at lower fabrication temperature. But the upper portion, the major portion, is lead rich. It will help the solder bond uh, can withstand a higher working temperature after binding. So overall, actually, this solder bond can can be can um can stand for high temp higher temperature compared to if you use all the composition at the lutetic point, right? So they do use this uh, idea idea to design this uh, solder bomb. And um before then now you know this one right? So before uh before this um. Before working, the electrical working means that before we apply the electrical current passing through this, uh, this uh, chips or this device, then they take a, a cross section of the solder bond under the SEM and in the back scattering mode. Then you can observe uh, the composition actually is the same with what we design here. The upper portion belongs to lead rich and the bottom portion belongs to tin, tin rich, right? Compared to tin rich. Some people probably uh, consider why the lead rich is lighter than tin rich under the, this uh, backscatter mode in SEM. The backscatter mode means we use the electrons flow, electrons to bombardment this uh, these materials and the lead has a heavy atomic weight than tin, so that will result uh, it turns out lighter than the tin. Okay, then 
after we uh, applying the current passing through this device, and you know the temperature gradient uh, was generated, and after a while, means the suffering uh, a certain time period of temperature gradient, then we also uh, take the cross section of this solder bump, and we find out uh, the composition changed. The tin moves from the bottom part toward to upper. Means the tin moves from lower temperature toward to high temperature. So this is the strong evidence showing that thermal migration did happen in this case, right? So when you apply the temperature gradient, then this, as long as this is high enough, it have chance to drive the atomic movement, right? So thermal, the definition for thermal migration is a thermal gradient induced mass transport resulting from what? The cross reaction e effect between the diffusion atoms and the heat flow. So this is evidence, right? So yes, yes, we know, we observe this phenomena, but we try to quantitatively analyze this effect, right? So let's try to quantitatively do, analyze this effect. So the first of all, as we mentioned before, we need to identify what kind of material we're dealing with. So the material we're dealing with is the, a dilute solution of interstitial component one in our materials. Then we, then it suffered a temperature gradient. So it's an interstitial as a dilute, right? Means the concentration of this interstitials is very low. So how many driving force apply, <coughs> apply on these materials? Probably the first, uh, the first one, you will say the temperature gradient, but also have uh, interstitials, right? So the second possible driving force would be chemical potential gradient, right? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So due to you have two driving forces, so you can formulate two flux. Regarding to the relating to the heat flow part, uh, J capital Q can be driven by the temperature gradient and also the chemical potential gradient. So you can uh, write down like the uh, driven by the temperature gradient minus temperature gradient divided by T times the direct coefficient plus the coupling coefficient times what the minus chemical potential gradient of these interstitials. But yet, even you formulate that, but this heat flux definitely need to obey the forest law can be expressed like a minus thermal conductivity times the temperature gradient for this uh, heat flow, right? And the, sec the, the other interstitial atomic flux one we are more interested in can be expressed like this, right? Direct driven by the minus chemical potential gradient times the direct coefficient, and indirect driven by the thermal uh, driving force minus temperature gradient divided by T times the coupling coefficient, right? But we are more interested in uh, at uh, on atomic flux. Why? Because, uh, as you know, as long as we have uh, the large interstitial atomic flux that tell you that you were left a vacancy, lots of vacancy, right? And under this situation, as long as you have lots of vacancy, then they have chance to aggregate, grow to form a void. So it may destroy the circle or destroy your metals, your materials, right? So that's why we are interested in the interstitial atomic flux, okay? So now we have the interstitial atomic flux expressed like this. But if you take this carefully, you will find that the chemical potential gradient actually will depending, will change with the temperature. So what parameters will affect the chemical potential gradient, chemical potential of uh, materials? As you learned before, we know the chemical potential depends on the concentration of interstitial and also the temperature. So you need to, uh, you can express, based on this description, you can express the, uh, the 
the mu one the change in the chemical potential can express like uh, separate into two terms the change in the concentration part plus the change in the temperature part so we try to so you can see that actually this inside this term have the concentration part and also temperature uh, the temperature part right so uh, as you know we take the gradient because we want to substitute this term and separate them into two terms, right? The one is concentration and the other one is temperature part. So based on this, we take a gradient on this term. So we got this one. So we copy this one, right? The same, right? But do you remember partial mu, partial C1 at the constant temperature? Have any idea? This it turns relax. You learned this, right? What's the relationship between the chemical potential gradient and the concentration gradient? You learn from that in Einstein relationship, right? In that slide, you know it's proportional relationship. So you take the, you move this term to the left-handed side, you got the KT divided by concentration is here. So we substitute this term become here and copy the, the, this term. And the second term is the What's the, what's the uh, partial mu, partial T at constant concentration? So means when you, any idea release, related to this one? After uh, deviation, actually this term is equal to partial atomic entropy. And the uh, detailed deviation you can check uh, from the lecture note, okay? So is that just substitute this term? as a partial atomic entropy so you got this result right it's a chemical potential gradient so we just substitute this chemical potential gradient by this concentration turn and minus this temperature gradient turn so you will got this one express like this so minus l11 chemical potential gradient you just use this term to substitute this i copy it here and the minus the coupling coefficient times the driving force, thermal driving force. And here, what we have is we have two different terms in concentration gradient and temperature gradient, right? So we need to arrange them. The first one actually is related to concentration gradient and definitely for sure will obey the fixed first law. So it can be expressed like this, minus the facility concentration gradient. Right, so this term will be equals to this term. So we also have additional information related to what this one, this one, this one will be equals to d one. Right. So if I ask you what's the l one one, you can know that, right? Okay. And the second term is this term times this term minus this term temperature part. We express like this. And this is due to the temperature gradient or thermal, also temperature gradient or thermal migration. So here, um, people will um, express like also the mobility concentration and the driving force. The driving force here is the minus heat of transport temperature gradient divided by T. So the driving force will be like this. But at this moment, you, you have some questions about how this 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 two terms how to merge in becomes to this term right so and based on this we know the heat of transport actually expressed like this so the detailed deviation will be here i show you so the first of all we need to as we mentioned this one related to the first term we know l11 kt c1 equals to d1 it's like this right okay the first, uh, first information we get here and the second information here I just express it I just combine this turn this turn and this turn so we got this two turns right probably I use the one j1q or j1t will be better this, this turn actually is only we talk about the, the, the temperature gradient turn right and this turn right and due to the temperature gradient is a driving force we also can express the mobility concentration and driving force and d1 kt is a mobility right d1 kt so we move the kt here so what you left is l11 divided by c1 
and times c1 so we can delete this one and we got the driving force so here we know the driving force you then this delete right so fq you move the l11 to this this uh divided by l11 so you got the fq expressed like this and this actually is similar with what you learn from uh, in the lecture one right the thermal driving force we define as a minus temperature gradient divided by t but this term you we have extra term here so this extra term we call is a heat of transport q chance heat of transport so the one with idea right so the reason for express this like this or arrange uh this driving force like this is just easy for you to remember and compare with the one you learn in lecture one for the one you learn in the lecture one it means if we if we ha i have a material i give you a temperature gradient on it i apply a temperature gradient on it the driving force you we will write down is a minus temperature gradient divided by t but under that case we don't we don't uh let's no tm uh happens but if there's a thermal migration happens, you need to use a heat of transport to modify the driving force. Okay? So this is the idea. The same idea with what you learn for the beta, right? If there's a no EM, then we don't have the driving force. We don't need to modify by the beta. But here, the same idea is a heat of transport, J, a Q chance. Okay? So next. Now you have idea the atomic flux, the interstitial atomic flux can be expressed like two ways. The first one is due to the concentration variation of these interstitials. So express uh, like a minus diffusivity concentration gradient. And the second term is due to, uh, we know the thermal, uh, the thermal migration happens. So be the mobility concentration and the driving force. And the driving force power we use the heat of transport times the minus temperature gradient divided by t and if you take a look on the heat of transport part actually it is related to the coupling direct coefficient minus the atomic entropy times the temperature and this term actually is related to the heat flow right because the definition for the entropy is the heat divided by temperature a change of heat divided by temperature and you delete the temperature turn so this turn actually definitely related to the heat flow okay so next uh you know the heat of transport will be related to the material we dealing with so every materials have its own heat of transport so how to measure that so uh, i'm going to show you how to measure that the idea will be the same with what you learn in EM, electron migration. So in, uh, in the beginning, I prepare material with the in, with the, uh, dopant. And this dopant was uh, located at the interstitials. And the concentration is uniform in the beginning, before we apply a temperature gradient. So we have the uh, concentration in uh, we have a concentration of the interstitials is uniform in these materials in the beginning then so this turn is delete right so next when i apply a temperature gradient temperature gradient i apply so that will induce what because we don't have this turn so what in induce atomic flux right so induce atomic flux then when i measure the concentration profile of these interstitials by xps or epma or seems then I can get this profile. This profile t implying that the atomic flux is is the atomic flux is, to, uh, is the direction is moved to the right hand side. So that will result the concentration profile becomes like this, right? From here to here. So let's definitely uh, atomic flux push these atoms toward to right hand side, and the value will be like this, right? And as long as you know. As long as there's a concentration variation happen in the material system, the fixed first law will try to counterbalance this uh, uh, flux induced by TM, right? And as you know, as long as uh, 
it reach quantity steady state means the, this one, this one, the value for this one is equals to the value for this one. Then you can it it under this situation we can call it the quantity steady state. Under this, this situation, the net flux of the atomic flux will be equals to zero. So this value equals to this value, so we can get the heat of transport of the system. Okay, so we need to measure that. But how to now understand we reach the quantity steady state, the net flux equals to zero? The only way is you need to measure the concentration profile of interstitials at different time periods until you confirm this profile does not change with time, that implies that the net flux equals to zero. At that moment, you further calculate the concentration gradient, temperature gradient, average concentration of interstitials, and uh, average temperature, put every information inside, and you can get the heat of transport of these interstitials in your material systems. But, Everything looks uh, perfect, right? But next, I'm going to uh, explain more about the sign. Because actually, probably maybe you were curious about the temperature gradient because I didn't say that the direction of temperature gradient I apply on the system. And it turns out the, the different direction will lead the different sign of heat of transport. Even we have the same concentration profile after diffusion. After uh, uh, after a while under the uh, EM, right? So I want to explain more. If the temperature gradient I apply is like this, the temperature gradient actually is positive, and this result, the positive concentration gradient, positive, positive, negative. So under this case, the heat of transport will be negative, so based on these results, you can have idea what means the heat of transport is negative. Based on these results, you got, you know, the atoms be pushed from low temperature to the high temperature. So the physical meaning of uh, the positive, uh, the negative heat transport means the temperature, the atoms be pushed against the temperature gradient. But however, on the contrary, if a temperature I, we apply on this material, temperature gradient is negative, then that will lead the uh, concentration gradient also like this. So it means the negative, positive, negative. So you got the positive heat of transport. And the physical meaning of positive heat of transport actually is what? The atoms be pushed from high temperature toward to low temperature. So will lead, that will lead this kind of profile. So will be the atoms be pushed along the temperature gradient from high temperature toward to low temperature. Okay. So the physical meaning of the sign, the part, the uh, heat of transport, actually is based on the, these results. We want to explain more about. Uh, what uh, what's me what uh, what that means when you have the positive heat of transport? That means the atoms be also implying that the atoms be pushed to where right due to this uh, temperature gradient you apply on it. So the positive one means the temperature be pushed toward to low temperature. And if the you got uh, your material is neg uh, negative heat of transport means the the atoms be pushed toward to high temperature. So under this situation, and my question would be, based on these results, the heat of transport of tin is positive or negative? After applying a temperature gradient, would be negative, right? Because tin be pushed toward to high temperature, from the low temperature to high temperature was against the temperature gradient. So heat of transport is negative, okay? So heat of transport is a new term. Um, so this slide is going to explain more about the heat of transport. And also want to clarify some, uh, some ideas in your mind.
related to the heat heat flow. For example, like we consider we have a component one diffuse along a long bar. So now we have a long bar, and there's a component one diffuse along a long bar, mean implying that what there's definitely a chemical potential variation happens. Oh, some people will think about a concentration gradient. So that will allow component one diffuse along a long bar, but but actually it's isothermal it means we put it this long bar at a low constant temperature so no temperature gradient exists on these materials under these situations you can formula two flux related to because there's a concentration variation so you, you can formulate atomic flux and related to even though there's isothermal but you also can formulate the heat flow right so atomic flux is driven directly driven by the minus chemical potential gradient, and the, the possible the other possible driving force is thermal driving force. But isothermal, so we don't have temperature gradient. So, uh, the temperature gradient part is zero. So atomic flux directly contribute due to the minus chemical potential gradient, and related to the heat flow, J capital Q, is directly driven by the temperature gradient, but we don't have that term and indirect driven by minus chemical potential gradient and times the coupling coefficient. So in this case, don't forget, as long as you, even though you only, you have the diffusion happens, it also accompany, you have got the atomic flux, but accompany with the heat flow. Even though it is isothermal, but don't forget, atomic flux accompany with the heat flow and if you check carefully we both these terms have the minus chemical potential gradients right so based on this we can link the atomic flux and heat flux expressed like this so the heat flux can express by this the coupling coefficient divided by the red coefficient times the atomic flux so that's the relationship between the atomic flux and heat flow and as you know, the heat transport defined by this. So this term is the same, right? So we want to substitute this term by heat of transport plus the absolute temperature times the partial atomic entropy. And we times the atomic flux individually. So you get this one. So this, this one, what this means? It just want to tell you doing the diffusion The heat flux actually, even in the, we perform that under the constant temperature isothermal conditions. The heat flow come from where? Uh, come from the first part is come from the flux of entropy. You can consider this term actually is a flux of entropy, right? And also come from the coupling term between the atomic flux and the heat flow. So as long as you have atomic flux, it will definitely carry or transport the heat. And also there's a, the heat flu flux also come from the interaction between the heat flow and atomic flux. Okay. So next I'm going to uh, give you uh, explain more about the sign of heat of transport, even though we took some, right? But I want to use this um, uh, these figures to explain more. If I apply, we apply the temperature gradient like this on our interesting materials, and uh, based on uh, the this coordinate, we know this gradient temperature gradient is negative, right? And if you already know the heat of transport of your uh, of your your of your uh, diffusing species is positive. It means that the atomic flux will be pushed. The least uh, diffusing atoms will move from high temperature toward to low temperature, so the direction will be go to the right hand side. So be moved from hot side to a cold side. And if the heat of transport of your diffusing atoms is negative, that means the atoms be pushed from the cold side toward to hot side like this direction, right? So I hope you can practice uh, this.
in the beginning, the uh in the concentration of interstitials is uniform. When you apply different temperature gradient, then um and you assume the heat of transport is positive or negative, and what's the uh, concentration profile of these inter uh, diffusing atoms. You can try to write them, roll them down, draw them down. 